welcome to your go-to Detroit Pistons podcast, The Pistons Pulse, co-hosted by me, Bryce Simon of Motor City Hoops, a former D1 Hooper and current teacher, husband, and father of three amazing kids. And I'm Omari Sanko for the second, Pistons beat writer for the Detroit Free Press. And of course, we're always blessed to be joined by our producer, Wes Davenport. And today we have the man, the go, the legend. And I could not be like, I guess get so excited that we can call Keith Smith a friend of the pod. Like, this is the coolest thing to me. This man has one of the best, maybe the best. In, well, you know, I'm on Game Theory, too. So I got to give that a shout out. But one of the best podcasts out there for NBA. Him and, and you know what? I don't give Trevor enough love as well. Trevor is awesome. Trevor Lane does a great job. I've got to know him a little bit also. But friend of the pod, contributor at Spotrack, make sure you guys are using that as well. The front office show, if you guys don't know, you should be listening to that. Even if you love the Pistons Pulse, you should be listening to the front office. Keith Smith, What's up? Welcome back. I don't know that we can outdo last time where we, where you played Woj and broke down a trade live on the episode. I don't think we can outdo that, but man, we're going to talk some ball today. Keith, welcome back. I appreciate it. Thanks so much for having me. Thanks for the kind words about front office show. We we have a lot of fun over there uh, Monday through Friday. We're in a little bit of a break right now because of the All Star break. Trevor's doing some traveling, but but we're we're just happy to you know have the chance to talk ball, and I'm excited to dive into the Pistons stuff with you guys. Keith, I'm just curious, when you get in between the trade deadline and the offseason, obviously you still have offseason stuff you can break down, but does your life get easier in the sense of just there's not as much maybe to project or what do you do during this time of the year? Yeah, for a little bit, it does. But Mm -hmm. now throwing myself more in now that I'm not covering a team anymore, I'm throwing myself into the draft way more. So I'm spending a lot of time uh, watching college, trying to catch international film where where I can and the like. So those are the things that I'm uh, spending more time on now. But the offseason, it sounds crazy. But it's only four months away. So like we're 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 like already doing all of our off season prep work. And a lot of what what I end up doing with that is it's a lot of conversations with players and teams and agents and what are you thinking? What are you thinking? Especially guys with options and guys with guarantees and the like and things like that. So those are the things that we're having a lot of those conversations. Then obviously still watching all the games and getting ready for the bet. You know, I'm a transaction guy. I get it. But the best time of the year is the playoffs, right? Mm-hmm. So, so that that so obviously trying to gear up for that and making sure I keep an eye on the teams that are a little bit further out too, because I don't want to get into an off season point and not understand. Hey, after the trade deadline, T Max started playing this guy twenty five minutes a night. I don't want to be surprised by that. So we try to keep tabs on everybody. Keith, is there someone at the top of the draft? Like, I, I mean, I feel like in general, have, have you got to watch Sar and Risa Shea and Cody Williams? Any strong takes in terms of like, I don't want to put you on the spot here. We didn't say that we were going to talk about the draft, but <laughs> is there a guy that you would have number? Like for me, it's Alex Sar. You know, I actually emailed you my top five after listening to your pod. But, you know, Risa Shea is right there. Cody Williams is a guy for people. Do you have kind of a, a, a leader at right now on February 18th with obviously tons that can change? Yeah, I like Alex Sar too. I, I think he's got kind of everything you want in a modern big. And I think eventually he's going to really expand his range even more and more consistently. You can see he's just got good touch. He's got got pretty good form. I think he'll be a pretty solid defender. I think if this was even five years ago, he might have been a little lower Agreed. because he's not he's just not very bulky and strong. Yeah. But I think the way he moves, I think now we're prioritizing movement defenders more than strength defenders in the NBA. And I think he'll add strength yeah. as you know as as he ages, as he grows. So I, I really like him. But I'm really starting to get big on Cody Williams. Okay. I, I just he 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 just there's he just he's like his brother. Like he just is impactful. Like he just does stuff. And there's even times when he's not shooting it well or he's not having the greatest offense. He's just involved. He's making uh, plays where he moves the ball. He's a competitive defender. So I really kind of like him. The fun thing about this draft is I get it's a quote unquote bad draft by the there's not the super duper star talent at the top. But I feel like the more I dive in, guys are like if we could import four guys at the top four picks yes. to be those stars. Yes. The next like five through like 20 are going to be good, solid NBA players. And then there's obviously going to be other guys who emerge beyond that. So, so I'm excited about the depth of the draft from the standpoint of, I think that will 
make up a little bit for the overall lack of superstar talent at the top. And I'll also just close out my thoughts on that. We say, whatever we say this, by the time we get to June, there's like three guys everybody's all fired up about. And then by the time we actually get in the next season, there'll be like four or five guys that are like, wow, these guys are actually way better than what we thought. Yeah. Rarely does a bad draft end up staying a bad draft all the way through the entire cycle. Yeah, I, I love what you said about importing four guys because I've made that exact same kind of <laughs> reference in terms of if you put, it, and not even Victor, but if you just put like Scoot, Brandon Miller, and a Min Thompson or something in this draft, Everybody would be raving about Alex Sar if he's your fourth pick or Cody Williams. If he was a, like, they just don't look like number one, potential number two guys. And it's like, that's just this draft. We kind of have to change our mindset with what the number one pick looks like. But Omar, we do have to talk a little bit about some Pistons news that I don't think we talked about on our previous episode. And Keith, we'll get your thoughts on this as well. So Omari, just break down what we know about Isaiah Stewart's incident with Drew Eubanks before that game against the Phoenix Suns, obviously there's been reports. He got arrested, released. It happened in the tunnel, whatever. What can you tell our listeners? And then we'll get Keith's thoughts and what he knows about it as well. Yeah. So, of course, Isaiah Stewart punched Drew Eubanks. For those who were out of the loop this past week, I could tell you what led up to it. Probably something in their last matchup against each other when Phoenix came to Detroit. But I really couldn't tell you what led to that beef that led to them you know, having an altercation hours before that last game on Wednesday. Uh, so I would assume that the NBA is waiting till after All-Star festivities die down a bit to hand out that punishment and that could be handed out by the time this episode comes out we will see um, beyond that i don't have a whole lot else to add except that it's just unfortunate for the pistons given that he had already missed the last nine games leading up to all-star break and after an incident like that especially with it being his second incident you know of course after the lebron situation a few years ago you would think that they would hand down a stronger punishment i don't want to try to predict how long it'll be but we'll just have to wait and see as far as that but i Obviously, an unfortunate situation whenever you have a player get in trouble and now you're looking at missing that player for several more games on top of what he already missed leading into All-Star break. Keith, what are your thoughts on this? And, you know, Amari talked a little bit about maybe what the punishment will be or could be. Like, you know, do you have any insight based on history of kind of how the, the league has handled these things with maybe other players, right, that have a little bit of history in these situations, have some other suspensions, that type of stuff? Yeah, I think one, you have a little bit of history here, so that's going to factor into the punishment as well. We've seen that, especially with Joe Dumars. He, he's referenced that in a handful of punishments he's handed down, whether they be fines or suspensions with that. I think also the NBA, they really don't like when this stuff happens off the court. They don't like it when it happens on the court either, but when it happens on the court, there's always the, I guess, the context of, Stuff happens in games. Guys get fired up and they go at each other sometimes. And sometimes it gets physical in a way, you know, we don't really like, but they, they, they own that, that that can happen. This happening hours before a game in, in a, not, not even, not even like they, I mean, maybe they did bump into each other. Who knows? But whatever it was that happened, it was like, they're not going to like that. So I'm going to guess we're going to see Isaiah Stewart get hit with, a fine suspension and, and he's probably going to miss a handful of games. Now the question will be, would he have missed those games anyway? Cause I know he's been dealing with an injury. So we'll, we'll find out what that looks like, but I do do expect he's going to get, he's going to get hit semi hard with this. I don't think it's going to be a 10 game suspension or anything like that, but I wouldn't be surprised if it's in that three to five game range, just because of the, the history and the fact that this happened off the court. All right, Keith, let's get into the deadline. So we're going to work kind of chronologically like we do with you. We're going to start at this year's deadline, though. We're going to move forward. We'll get your thoughts on the young core and how the team's looking. And then we'll get into the offseason because I know Pistons fans have a lot of questions because there's a lot of talk about cap space and you know, free agent <laughs> class and all of that. But let's go back to the deadline. I want to zoom out first and then we can ask you about specific deals. But zooming out, they get rid of Boyan and Burks and Monty Morris, like all of these older, quote unquote, players with expiring contracts. I know Boyan's not exactly as expiring, but we all, you know, the two million guarantee. They bring in not necessarily youth, 
or younger players, but like three and D essentially guard wings, Grimes, Fontecchio, I think even like Troy Brown and Shake Milton would fit into that to some extent. What were your thoughts overall, just kind of on the roster construction management, kind of like what this team now looks like here as we go through the next couple months to finish off the season? Yeah, I think even if we go back almost a month earlier to the Bagley trade, sure. they signaled we're going after cap space in that trade because otherwise there was no real reason to get off of his money for next year by giving up uh, what they gave up to do that. So so that was signal number one, right? Like we're, we're going after cap space. So then it became, of course, we had a lot of stories of, well, we don't have to trade these guys. And, and I like to always remind people, there's a ton of posturing that goes on at the trade deadline, right? It, it starts out with every guy you have to have two first round picks for, and then sometimes it it's, all right, we're fine to take a single second in those kind of things. But did, given the Pistons, year ago deadline where they kept those guys that that you, you had to at least go and say, Hey, maybe they will hang on to some of these guys. I think the Fontecchio deal, it started out slightly confusing because it was what is happening here. Like, like this guy is where you're taking on a little bit of money uh, here in this trade. You're, you're picking up a guy who if you want to keep him, you're going to have to resign him. What is that going to look like? But when you look at it in the aggregate, it makes a lot more sense because my guess is they were probably somewhat far down the line on the Bogdanovich trade when the Fontecchio deal got done. These things, it, we like to think of them as all sequential order. And that's like my brain wants to think of these sure. things this way yeah. just because it makes it very simple math wise. But that's not how it works, right? You're having a hundred conversations at once and you're trying to just piece it all together. And then, then ultimately there comes a time where it's like, all right, we have to lay these out now because we have to order them to, to get the transactions in. But I think what, what they're doing here is it was just a reset of things with get the long-term money out, but let's still have a few vets here. But these are now vets where we don't have to play them. Well, we don't have anything invested in Troy Brown Jr. We don't have anything invested in Jake Milton. We have nothing invested in Evan Fournier. If they play, great. If they don't, it's not the end of the world. Where guys like Bogdanovich, you had an investment in him because they had traded for him and extended him. Burks, you went out. Hey, I know that was a salary dump trade initially, but you had him for a couple of years. Kevin Knox was a guy you actively signed. So now you changed it to, hey, if we want to have a game where Thompson's going to get 40 minutes tonight, no matter if he throws the ball in the eighth row 25 times, like you can do it because no one's going to say, you know, we, we really should play Alec Burks. And, and if, you know, if Evan Forty is getting upset, you're like, cool, man, like you're probably out of here in four months anyway. So we don't necessarily really care all that much if you're upset while the kid is out there making mistakes. So that's, I think, the rebalancing. And then obviously getting off that future money gave them that flexibility moving forward. The Pistons were more active than any other team during the deadline by a pretty wide margin, which is not surprising given the circumstance that they started the season under, uh, which everybody knows we'll necessarily need to recap. Overall, not necessarily a grade on their deadline, but sort of what did you see the Pistons trying to accomplish with the moves they made, uh, obviously with Fontecchio and Quentin Grimes probably being the two most significant assets they got back? Yeah, I, I feel like, and I didn't mention Grimes before, and Grimes is obviously in a different case than a lot of those other guys because he is somebody you can move forward with as part of things uh, there. So I think that that was uh, was a great pickup. I think overall, when you look at all their moves, like you said, the Fontecchio move initially seemed a little confusing because that one came out early in the morning, right? Or at least yeah. in the morning portion, and then the rest built as the day went along. That one was a little like, okay, I guess, like, I guess add a shooter for not really all that much, sure, why not? But then when when you looked at the rest, it was like, okay, I kind of get this. These these moves piece together in a pretty logical way where it was, all right, let's, let's go. And then obviously making the, the Knicks move primarily being the primary driver of this, you took on a whole bunch of extra guys in that trade. So that meant some guys had to be waived. And I think, the writing was on the wall. Joe Harris wasn't going to make it through the deadline or much beyond. He was going to get waived. Gallo, I was a little surprised. I'm guessing they held on to him just with the idea of, let's see if we can retrade him somewhere. When that didn't materialize, that made sense that they moved on. And then Killian Hayes was obviously a surprise. Anytime 
And, and I get it. People are going to be like, no, it wasn't. He stinks, right? Like, I fully get that. But anytime it's a draft pick, it's always surprising when the guy doesn't make it to the end of his of his rookie contract. But hey, I kind of get it, right? It was, hey, what are we going to do? I, I likened it to that day, on trade deadline day. I even tweeted, I, I love the movie Moneyball. And I even tweeted, this was like, I can't play pain yet. I saw that, trade yes. anymore, <laughs> Right, like, take the club out of the bag for Monty Williams. Like, you, we had no more minutes for, for Killian Hayes, no more starts for Killian Hayes. And I, and I like to imagine Monty's like, well, why not? Cause he's, cause he's gone. I traded or I weighed him right in this case. But anyway, it's a, yeah, I think the conjunction of stuff makes sense. And what, what I liked seeing too was getting guys like Fontecchio, Shake Milton, Troy Brown Jr. Those are guys that can come in and can help on nights when you need it. When you just need, Hey, we need a, another veteran out here. Or, you know, this game's tight. We're, we're in it in the fourth quarter. We want to try to get after it. And, and I realized Fontech, he was only a second year NBA guy, but he's played professionally for years. So he counts in my mind as a veteran. So you, you, you basically add those guys in there, a couple, couple shooters in that mix too, to help just rebalance things. Uh, I know Fontech, you started, I would assume the lineups are all lineups and rotations are going to be very much in flux the rest of the way. But Fontecchio already started a couple games for the team. I would assume there's a good chance that probably continues, especially as I just get a look at what he looks like with other guys. So I, I really liked what, what they did kind of just in the aggregate. It, it's one of those things where it's like, okay. And, and I was a big like proponent of it's, you got to do something with Bogdanovich and Burks. We can't let this continue to drag out, drag out. And, and, and I know some were disappointed, like, well, they didn't get first round picks. We kind of got first round pick value in Quentin Grimes if he is what you think he may be. And then I don't know that that was ever realistic to get those first round picks anyway. So why not turn them into something and, and, and keep things moving? All right, Keith, I want to go back to Fontecchio just a little bit, and then we will get back into, because I think it'd be nice to talk about Burks and Boyan and did the, the value of all that. The Fontecchio one was surprising to me because I was like, oh, this makes sense, right? A, a 27, 20 year old who can space the floor. I think he's a little better defensively than what people like just automatically think like they probably think he's just a traffic cone. It's like, no, this is a big, strong wing forward that plays hard, at least if nothing else on that end of the floor. I saw a lot of national media people like crush this. Like, why are they giving away pick 34? I realized that, but also my quick argument is how many young guys can they conceivably have? They are already valuing a ton of these and you're going to have a top five pick. So that was my thoughts. What were your thoughts on that individual trade? I know you've mentioned it a couple of times. And then this question from QT, he will help. How much is he going to re-sign for though? So he is in a contract year. So maybe you can give us some insight into what that could look like potentially this offseason. Yeah. So if we start with the trade part of things, I think the value is fine because of what you referenced. They The one spot where this team doesn't have a lot is at the forward position. They've got some bigs. They've got some guards. They they just don't have a lot of forwards oh, on this team because I think Thompson is still – he's more of like a, a true wing to me versus a forward guy. So you get that. Obviously, we know the shooting is – not where we probably want it to be. So, so that gives you, gives you some shooting there. So I think that's fine. And, and I think the idea of the, the sense of the, the, how was I going to say this? The giving up the draft pick, you're I'm spot on with that. At some point, it's like, all right, we can't have 35 kids on this roster. You're going to add another barring complete disaster, you know, another top, three pick hopefully it doesn't go the way last year's lottery went and it ends up the fifth but at least the top five pick and that that's so now that guy's gonna come in too so now when you start kind of replacing things a little bit this makes a lot of sense what he's gonna resign for that's a really fascinating question for two reasons one is he's a restricted free agent so the pistons should they choose to make him a restricted free agent and i think they will just given up the value given the value they traded for him they're going to control the process. And restricted free agents get squeezed. They they tend to be the last guys off the board in free agency just because teams don't want to tie up the cap space. Even in the new rules where it's only a day, you still have to wait for the moratorium and all this other stuff. And, and teams just don't want to tie up the cap space waiting to find out, are we going to get said player or not? You also generally have to overpay because if you give them any kind of fair value contract, 
the team's just going to match it and move on. So I think with Fontecchio, the Pistons' ability to control that process should keep his number a lot more reasonable. Restricted free agency, quite frankly, it sucks for the player. Like, it's just, it's just, it's, you get it because the team invests the draft pick in general for most restricted free agents. They developed the guy, they gave him millions of dollars already. You want to give them a leg up on retaining them. But from the player side, it's just, it's a, it's a flawed system. So they'll control it. Now, on the flip side, there's a lot of cap space out there this summer and the free agent class isn't very good. So what you could see a team do is, let's say you're, and I'm completely making this up, let's say you're Orlando or you're Oklahoma City or a team that has a good amount of cap space and you're like, you know what we, we need? A forward who can put the ball in the hoop and can shoot a little bit. They may come in with one of those overpay offers and they may fly in with a, hey, let's do something that is 15 to 20 million a year because our cap sheet can sustain it. It doesn't really isn't going to hurt us. We can make this kind of move. And then that puts the Pistons in a spot where it is, all right, are we going to swallow hard and match this? Or are we just going to say, all right, you know, we're, we tried, but that's too rich for us. You know, let the guy move on. So I tend to think that probably won't go that way. So I'm going to guess something in the mid-level-ish range, probably the 10 to 14 million range, somewhere in there. He's a slightly older player, as you referenced, so he probably would like a three- or four-year deal just to lock in some of that security and lock in an NBA role. And I think that's fine. The Pistons are so clean with forward-looking money right now that even if that deal by the end, you're like, eh, I wish it wasn't quite that, you should be fine to 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 eat that contract on your books, even if it starts to go slightly underwater. All right, we're going to go to a short break. And then Amari, when we come back, I think you were going to ask Keith about the Alec Burks, Boyan Bogdanovich trade to the Knicks for Quentin Grimes, some other players in draft capital. All right, we are back with segment two. Keith, I think the situation uh, where the Pistons are playing these expiring 30-year-old guys has been, uh, I don't want to say the bane of fans' existence, but that's been probably the top (laughs) of the list as far as situations. You're just wondering how it'll be resolved. And the Pistons, of course, did not get a first-round pick, but they did get a guy in Quentin Grimes who they believe can be a key piece for this team moving forward. Just overall, what did you think of the valuation of that deal, of course, which also also brought back Evan Fournier and yeah, Matt Malachi Flynn. And just how do you value it and what do you see Grimes uh, maybe being for this team value-wise going forward? Yeah, I think Grimes, when he's healthy and ready to go, which hopefully will be shortly after the All-Star break, I, I think he's going to come in as a real nice replacement for Burks. In a lot of ways, I think he'll be that first guard off the bench. He's got pretty good size, so I think he can kind of play even. The nice thing with Kate Cunningham is you have a ton of flexibility lineup-wise because he can defend up a position just size-wise. So I think Grimes' ability comes in. He's probably going to mostly play as the two, but you slot him in there and just kind of let it, let him go. And, and you're, you're, you're moving forward. And then if he proves out to be the guy we all liked better a couple years ago, then all of a sudden it's like, oh, we maybe have a little bit of depth here at the guard spot that, that we weren't necessarily counting on, you know, two, three weeks ago. So that I think is is a really good sign there. I think that his his acquisition in that trade, that becomes your first round pick equivalent to what they'd hope to get for Bogdanovich and or Burks. And then they got the two seconds, which are good. I know Ryan Archer Diakono is already out of the picture. I don't have a lot of faith in Malachi Flynn doing much. I, I, yeah, I'll be quite frankly, I'll be upset if he plays a lot over Marcus Sasser going forward. Just because you have an investment in Sasser, I'd rather play him and let him learn on the fly and figure it out than giving minutes to Flynn. I think he's just your third point guard for the, the next four four months, I guess, or really two months ish of the season as as the Pistons season will wind down. So that gives you that, and then. Fournier is the one that becomes a little interesting. I think if there's nights where guys are out, play him, see what it looks like. Maybe, maybe you can get in a position where he's playing well enough and you start getting a little uh, word from teams of, 
hey, if you pick up that option, we'd, we'd be all right to trade for him. That could be the way that goes. I think most teams are counting on that option being declined, and then he'll just be a be a free agent, and they can go about, about it that way. But, but we'll see. So I think Fournier, give him minutes when you need to. But, again, I don't want to see him play regular minutes over any of these other younger guys because it just doesn't make a lot of sense, or even Fontecchio, who seems to have a little bit of a future here. So I – I, th- I think they did good, you know, overall in the trade and in getting those couple seconds back. That that kind of rebalances the books a little bit after giving up, you know, the the seconds in the the or the second in the trade for Fontecchio. So so you just kind of keep keep the draft coffers a little full there, and, and you could do, do your thing. So I I think they did well. I know some people were like, how did they not get the protections released on it? They don't want, I don't think they want the protections released because they don't want to give a good pick. Like they, this is not a case where they're sitting there and they're like, like Oklahoma City had protected picks where it's like, hey, that team's already good. Let's re up protection. So that way that pick will, then we can get free and clear of it. They're not in that spot. So I think that's the, the different thing, right? You, you, you're fine to let that pick carry out because, because you don't, you, you, you certainly don't want to give the Knicks a top, Five ten pick anywhere in the next couple of years, so so I think that's a you know good good work there as well to not get sucked in on that. Well, so I've thought about this. Tell me if I'm wrong here, Keith. As this doesn't convey more and more, and you know one more year out, they get access to picks. I feel like it's not quite as important because I don't think Pistons fans want back control over that selection for any reason other than they see that they need to have a certain amount of assets to go trade for a big player. And my thing is like, now we're almost to the point. I I think the Pistons, I I emailed you about this. If we got to the off season and it was after the draft, they could trade this year's first round pick after they select him. And then I believe 2029 and 2031. I mean, so they essentially could get a package together of three first round picks. If I'm not mistaken with, you know, even with those protections on the Knicks pick. So I feel like I've gotten to the point where I'm not as worried about that because they're starting to get access to the, you know, plus you could do two pick swaps and everything else. So am am I crazy for feeling like I don't see the urgency to do that? Like I did maybe two years ago or even a year ago as some of these come more available in the future. Yeah, I'm not worried about that either for all the reasons you laid out. I, it's also become increasingly common in the NBA in recent years to do things like you write up the language where it is this, like, let's say it was this year. They, they could trade the 2026 pick, but write the language as if the pick conveys in 2024. And it, that's probably not a great example because we know this year's pick's not going to convey. So let's go to next year's pick. Yeah, and they, 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 so the protections roll over. They could write it up and say trade a 2027 pick if they convey a pick in 2025, and that can, it gets very confusing to track and follow and all that. But it's it's happening more and more. We're seeing that the Spurs had to do that with the Bulls. It was really the Bulls doing it in the Nuggets in trades with Orlando in the Spurs and OKC. They had a bunch of their picks that were written up conditionally like that. So that's a that's a more common thing where it becomes, hey, it's basically first allowable pick you're, you're going to get. The other thing I think people forget too is the Pistons could always trade the protected portion. And then you trade that protected portion if they really wanted to, to say, hey, player X is worth it for us to give up a top five pick. We'll trade that protected portion away, and then then it's then the, the team inherits it just like like they would with whatever conditions are on it with with the Pistons and the Knicks, or where they could even chunk up those protections even more and say, "Hey, we're keeping it if it's top one or two, and then the rest can go." And that that starts to get a little confusing there because then you got to work out, and then if you don't send it, what happens, and all these other things. And first round picks, we've had one I think in the last decade where it was if it didn't send. Nothing happened like it expired. And it was, I think, one where a team was like, we're going to get it. So we're, we're really not worried about it. And it did go go to them early. But but those are pretty few and far between. So, yeah, I mean, draft pick wise, they're, they're fine. As far as tradable assets go, yes, they owe this pick to the Knicks, but it's not going to be anything that's going to keep the Pistons from making a big trade if that, that big trade is out there to be made. Keith, there was so much focus on that first round pick that the Knicks 
owned from the Pistons. And, you know, I think a lot of people, well, a lot of fans specifically, I'm not going to say the Pistons necessarily, but they wanted to see that pick come back, you know, just so they can open the door to bigger trades down the road and whatnot. To get a guy in Grimes who is more of a proven commodity, uh, we saw what he did in his second season. Uh, year three has been um, a little bit of a down year. I guess where's the valuation that, as far as that uh, for a Pistons team that has a lot of young guys already, just how much more valuable or if not, do you see it just to get a guy in Grimes who fits an immediate need now and is a little bit further ahead of the timeline compared to who you would use that pick for? Yeah, I, I think this is a good way to split the difference for the Pistons where it is we're not getting a complete mystery box in terms of another pick or a player who's played a hundred minutes in the NBA or anything like that. Like we're getting a guy who contributed as a regular starter to a playoff team a year ago. And that's not even like, we're not even talking about a guy who had a great rookie season, then disappeared for two years and then came back. Like just a year ago, he was a key player. And all that really happened was he had squeezed by the Knicks adding Josh Hart and then uh, signing Dante DiVincenzo and, and having to go slightly different in the in the backcourt after Emmanuel quickly was traded. They, they needed much more of an on-ball guy. Now, Quinn Grimes, what's been a slightly disappointing is he is still – this sounds so weird because this was always such a positive, favorable turn, but he's just a 3 and D guy right now. And – we were the hope was all right. He was a three and D guy last year. Let's come back year three, be able to attack a closeout, be able to be a secondary creator, be able to you know do something off a couple of dribbles, be able to be a better transition finisher. He's still now every time he runs the floor in transition, unless it's no one in front of him, he drifts to the to the to the corner to the elbow, and and that's just where he goes. So it's it's fine, and I think what you're looking at if you're the Pistons is. It's okay. We've got the on-ball guys right now. We we can afford to to let him still maybe work through a little bit of that stuff. Just, yo, know, all right, if you close out hard on you, we need you to take a dribble or two, make a pass or a shot. And that's fine. But I think they need a little bit more 3 and D um, in their rotation. And this is a guy who can give them that 3 and D. It isn't 32 years old, right? He's still young. He's there. So I think that's the value that comes in. Whereas... I get it, right? The the whole idea of get a first round pick and the mystery it can be anything, right? It could it can be, you know, uh, Isaiah Thomas is the you know last pick in the draft and becomes an all star, right? The chances are that's probably not going to happen. So if you had got, let's say the Knicks gave them their pick this year, you're going to pick that's what like twentieth ish in that range. So maybe somebody pops, but the chances of that player popping and being better than Grimes is right now. They're they're not great, right? Even the, even though it is a first rounder, so I I, I get it. I, I get caught up in the whole idea of draft picks, draft picks, draft picks. But sometimes you could give me a young, established player still on his rookie scale deal. I'll take that all day, every day. So I also want to ask this because I found myself doing the same thing I did with the James Wiseman trade and the Marvin Bagley the third trade, where it's like, okay, the value on this doesn't make sense, but. If they unlock Marvin Bagley the third, if they unlock James Wiseman, this makes a lot more sense. So my question, Keith, is one, my opinion is just the positional value makes more sense, right? It, it, we're, we're talking about non-stretch bigs in those two guys on a team that already has non-stretch bigs. Grimes at least makes more sense positionally as, like you said, a 3 and D guard slash wing would you agree with that? And do you think he's just a like? Do you think he's a safer bet to at least be an NBA contributor compared to when those trades were happening? Regardless of the value, like I realize that more was given up to get Grimes. Like I understand that, but I feel like those is like these guys really have to show more than what they've shown. Do you feel like Grimes is at least a little bit better of like, hey, this is at least a eight to nine, you know, and maybe better, but rotation man on an NBA team? Yeah, I think so. Hey, definitely way ahead of where Wiseman ever was at any point. You know, he, he, Quinn Grimes, again, he started for a playoff team already and played pretty well that entire year. So where Wiseman, he hadn't shown much at all. So so I think that's the the one thing there. And for what it's worth, I still think there's a world where two years from now, James Wiseman is a solid rotational big, just sometimes big men take 
a long time to figure it out. There's also a world where two years from now he's not playing in the NBA at all. So, you know, all of them, there's a big wide range outcomes. Well, the Bagley was in such a weird spot because he put up pretty solid numbers, but on terrible Kings teams. So it was a little like, okay, that becomes that whole, well, what do I make of this uh, piece? But Grimes had just, when you're starting on a playoff team in your second year, that's good. And that wasn't a gifted starting spot. Tom Thibodeau doesn't do that. So he really earned that spot. And, and yeah, and I think, and then when you look at what his profile is, is a guy who can, if, if all he ever is, is a pretty good three and D guy, that's fine. As long as you don't go crazy with whatever you give him on his next contract, that that's better than the two backup, maybe bigs and Bagley and, and uh, Wiseman. So yeah, I think way ahead of where, where it was there as far as value and where the player was at the time they acquired him. Keith, this is a little bit more big picture, but there's been, I think this front office is figuring out the right moment to make that big splash and, you know, look like for a moment they might do it this trade deadline. And then they decided, well, the deal we want isn't really there. So we're going to wait until this off season, but that's sort of been the MO for this front office for a few years now. Just looking at this upcoming, I don't want to say free agency class because free agency is not what it used to be five, six years ago. But do you see a market where the Pistons could be justified in their decision to uh, postpone that big move and potentially make that splash this offseason? I think so, but I'm glad you put that qualifier on it. It's not going to be by signing a player. Right. It, 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 well, let me put it this way. It better not be by signing yeah. a player. I'm going to come on here yeah. and I'm going to trash them up and down. Cause that's yeah. like, no, not to, not to give everybody PTSD and make them, you know, scream at their computers. But then we're talking about Charlie Villain, the wave of Ben Gordon summers yeah. and, you know, Josh Smith summer and that kind of thing. That's that, that would be a monumental mistake. There's just not going to be that kind of free agent out there. I mean, who knows what LeBron will do, but you know, no offense. I don't think he's going to the Pistons. So, right. So it's, it's just now maybe they draft Brody and say, hey, now Brody at number one to get LeBron (laughs) in free agency. (laughs) What did we change your mind here, fellow? But I I, I, being realistic, I don't think that's where that's going to go, but I think what's going to happen. And we saw this. If you look at the trade deadline, big, right. The entire 30 team league, there were not superstar trades made. I, I, I didn't like the, the characterization of nothing happened because I think people got a little caught up on Kevin Durant and Kyrie Irving last year. And that's pretty uncommon. We don't generally see guys like that get moved. But this year, you know, if we expanded out, James Harden got traded earlier, Siakam, Ananobi, right? Those are all NBA, all star level guy, and then Ananobi, young player that everybody loves. And they just happened early. Then in the trade deadline, it was a whole bunch of moves where it was, we're going to move money around. We're going to acquire role player X to try to beef ourselves up. But what we didn't see was teams say, now's the time. Let's go in on that guy. But we've got a couple factors at play here. And I'll nerd out if I can just for a minute. Absolutely. We have roughly a third of the league, and it's probably going to be a little over a third of the league going into next offseason that are looking at apron issues. So either they're going to be at or above the first apron, and then at least half of that group, if not more, are dealing with second apron issues where it's we're going to be really expensive. Now, for teams like Boston, Milwaukee, Phoenix, the Clippers, those teams are all in. Those teams are all title contenders. So they're not going to worry about that stuff too much. For teams like the Warriors, it sounds crazy because they're, they have a terrible record. But the Atlanta Hawks are in this spot. Some of those teams are in a position where we got to figure some stuff out. And I, you don't have to go any further than Joe Lacob basically said, we got to get out of this second apron repeater tax stuff because we're just, we're, we're no longer good enough to, to justify spending, you know, when you combine payroll plus uh, you know, tax penalties over $400 million and then pushing up to, it's looking like they could be a half a billion dollar roster next year between uh, salary and taxes. So what you're going to see is you're going to see a handful of these teams, whether it be the, you know, the, the, the warriors or some of these other teams that just, we don't really want to live in this world. They're going to start making moves and they're going to start making trades where it is. We're going to start, shedding away some of this salary. 
I'm not saying Stephen Curry's getting moved, but wouldn't surprise me if hey Andrew Wiggins is on the move or Chris Paul doesn't get picked up or we don't even resign Clay Thompson or we resign him to a much lower number. Or if you're in Atlanta, there's reason the buzz is building that Trey Young could be available because the Hawks may look at this and say, our only real way out of this to reset our books and add talent is to trade Trey Young. And we're stuck in the middle with him. We're probably going to be stuck in the middle without him. So what difference does it really make? We might as well not be as expensive and at least have some stuff to build forward. So we're, we've are we already started over on front off show calling it summer of the trade because I think you're going to see teams lining up to, to go get some stuff. One other team too, and this one could maybe be where the Pistons get involved, unless Minnesota makes a real run at the finals. Something has to give there. They cannot be as expensive as they project to be. They project to be a second apron team with only like eight guys under contract. And that's before Mike Conley and now Monte Morris, before you do anything for resigning those guys. And I think what they're going to do is look at it. Now, if they make a finals run, it changes the calculus and they'll probably say, all right, we can't first great team we've ever had here. We can't break it up. But if they don't, I think you're going to see them look at it and say, all right, what are we going to do? We're not trading Anthony Edwards. That's our store. We're not trading Jaden McDaniels because he doesn't make enough to make a difference. We're going to go bear. anchors our defense in a way no one else really can. I think that's where a guy like Carl Anthony Towns all of a sudden might be available. And it's like, whoa, what happened here? And then you've got a bunch of teams that are maybe sitting on cap space that could probably use a talented big. They might be looking and saying, all right, we can afford to make the play at this and see if we can figure it out. So you're, you're, you're going to see movement in that direction. Who? Yeah, I don't know. Right? Let's let's talk again in a few months when the playoffs have played out a little bit, and then we'll have a better idea. But, but we're definitely going to get that kind of movement for sure. All right, no doubt. And that's what I tell people on social media, like the free agency market, like that's not a thing. People say they're not going to be able to sign anybody. You're right. They're not going to be able to. That's why they're going to trade for somebody. Like, <laughs> yeah. that's, like, like, like that's the new free agency now. So uh, Yeah, I have a meme I go to whenever I tweet anything about cap space and people, and people are like, but who, who, no one's even available. It's a bunch of terrible. And it's the Simpsons bus driver where it says, don't make me tap the sign. Yeah. And I made the sign says trades, yeah. Uh, Cap space can be used for more than just signing mm-hmm. players. Like, like I, I, I always am like, that's just my standard response to it. So it's, you know, you, you yeah, there's, there's, there's just going to be a lot of guys available, even like a, another bad team, Portland right now projects to be a, be an apron team next summer. If they don't make moves like yeah, that, that's, you can't, that can't happen, right? You, you cannot be that bad of a team and, and be sitting there, you know, going into the luxury tax. So, so there's going to be stuff. And then, if LeBron is all of a sudden available, just throw everything out the window because who know, right? Then we know every time LeBron's a free agent, everything gets a little haywire. So that's where, where it'll get, you know, it'll start to get a little crazy. All right. I have a question very specifically about this, but we got to go to a short break. So let's go to that. When we come back, Amari, I got a question I want to ask that stays on this and then we can move on after that one. All right, we are back with segment three. Uh, we're going to lead off with a question from Bryce here, and then looks like we have some questions, so we'll be able to dive into a few of those. So, All right, so Keith, I want to ask this because, and I talked to you about this a little bit before we started recording. So Team Savant brings up Brandon Ingram, right, with the Pelicans if things don't go there. Philip Binder brings up a team that you just said, Jeremy Grant with the Blazers. So my question, and you can use either one of those, is the cap space the Pistons have how much value could that provide in one of those trades in terms of not sending anything back to those teams? I assume that opens up a rather massive trade exception and all like, is that valuable or would a team actually want matching salary because you want to hold that, like that salary you have a certain term for it. I think you know where I'm going with this, where then you can flip that on, right? The Warriors did this with, D'Angelo Russell, right? Like instead of not taking anything back, they wanted the salary so then they could move the salary. So am I like, which way am I making sense here in terms of, you know, is this something that could be valuable in a trade or does it end up not actually mattering that the Pistons have so much space that they don't have to send money back? Yeah. Hugely valuable. How, 
hugely valuable depending on the team you're trading with. So if you're, let's say it was the Clippers okay. who are committed to, we're going to stay over the, 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 the apron and whatever because Steve Ballmer made the money to pay the penalty in the time it took me to say this sentence, right? So, so it doesn't matter to him. He's committed to winning. For the Clippers, it doesn't have as much value to just straight up dump a contract to Detroit because they don't really care. They would rather have the contract to be tradable salary moving forward. If you're the trailblazers, and let's use Jeremy Grant as an example, because there is history there, you are in a position where I don't want to be <laughs> over the tax line. So it's massively valuable to me to send your Jeremy Grant and take nothing or very little back because you could just absorb his salary by, by cap space. The Pelicans are a great team where they're right on the tipping point, right? It it could depend. A guy like Brandon Ingram could be hugely valuable to just shed it and say, you know, we're actually pretty good rolling forward with Trey Murphy and, and saying, well, we think we can do what we need to do there. The other piece of that with the Pelicans becomes, actually, you know what? We're not going to have enough maneuverability anyway if we move him. So we'd rather have some money back. Send, send us some money back. I think the Knicks trade was a great example right now at the at the deadline because for the Knicks was we either turn Fournier's $19 million contract into some other money that we either carry long-term forward and you know, I know everybody's like Donovan Mitchell, Donovan Mitchell, right? It's, it's either that or we turn it into kind of roll it over. We get a guy who can help obviously in Bogdanovich, and we've now we've got $19 million that we can still work with. And basically what you did was you kind of kicked the can down the road on what do you do with that $19 million salary all the way through till next trade deadline. So so that's the 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 part of this. It, it's very dependent on teams. Now you can even make it just much easier, even if it's not a team facing tax and apron issues. Let's say that the the Pistons were hooked up with, I don't know, I'm making it up, but Orlando in trade talks. And they were like, you know, we we really want to get Wendell Carter Jr. or Jonathan Isaac. You could, it just makes it easier because it's, hey, we can send you back money or you know what? You you just want to move them because you're trying to open up more cap space. Let's go. Here, here you go. And that, that just made, makes things that much easier. So sometimes it seems at the other end of the spectrum, too, that are, hey, we're really trying to open up cap space here and and you you can help them along. We've seen that happen, right? A, a few times in the Troy Weaver regime of, yeah, we'll eat your contracts for this. I think they're trying to maybe turn it slightly differently where it is we don't want to just eat every bad veteran contract because we're the only ones sitting there with cap space. But I do think it's a little different. Now, the one kind of cautionary thing that I'll say with this, this is not like it was a couple years ago where you can just sit on open cap space all the way into the season. And then you remember a couple years ago, the Pacers and Spurs were everybody's fav- third, favorite third team in and in the trade trade machines because it was, oh, this, they're not going to want to take, oh, just send them there with a second and that's good enough. You can't do that anymore. By the time we start the regular season, you be, you have to be at the floor as far as what you have to spend. And if you're not already there, what happens is the league comes in and they put a put a it's a false cap hold. We'll sit on your books to eat up the difference. So you can't go into the season anymore with 30, 40 million dollars in cap space. You can go in with like 10 ish is is roughly where it works out to a little bit more than that you could still sit on that and the Pacers did that this year that's part of how they made their sequence of moves to, to get Pascal Siakam but that that's the difference right that that's where it just becomes a little bit different so you're, if you're gonna try to do the whole hey we'll we'll be the facilitator we'll take on money team you got to do that sooner rather than later now but I, I think it's more beneficial especially this summer going to be, hey, you know what? We want to be the Rockets. We want to take real steps forward. And the way you do that is the Rockets did it by signing guys. Maybe you sign a couple guys, but you trade for a couple guys too, and you kind of make it, make move it forward that way. No doubt. Uh, we have a few questions here. Uh, we're going to dive into these quickly. Uh, first, we have a question from my pops. Uh, with Simone, can I do a front-loaded deal with salary that decreases to offset the future impact of matching a restricted free agent offer? Overpaid by a different team. So can they sign Simone to a declining deal, basically in restricted free agency? And would that be 
something that could be beneficial for them. Yeah, they could. This is uh, to go back to Orlando. No team loves a declining contract more than the Magic. And this is what they did with Wendell Carter Jr. Now, there's two things that that come into play here. When you sign a player to a declining deal, it can make it really hard to extend them at the end of that declining deal because now their number is much lower. In the case of a guy like Fontecchio, it's probably never going to be an issue. He's never going to be a guy who's going to push for probably more than $20 in a season, even if everything goes amazing. Hey, it's probably just not going to happen. So yeah, you could definitely do a deal where in the, they may have already started these conversations, right? It's I, I always say, let's all be grownups on this stuff. Everybody's already talking, right? So it, it, they may already say, hey, we're willing to do a three-year, $45 million deal where we give you $18 million in year one. And then we take it down year over year from, from there. And if they if that's where it goes, that's great. Right. That, that's that's awesome for for Detroit, because that as he ages and maybe slows down a little bit, that that puts you in a better place. So Ben asked, and this is interesting because I, I think sometimes I want to just keep this big picture in mind. And the big picture is really starting to come very soon. And, and you can give your thoughts here, Keith, as well on, you know, what you think these kids are in terms of KJI Duran? I think we saw you know some more time to figure out a SAR, obviously. But Ben says, do the Pistons have the ability to sign all three of these to rookie Mac extensions and have cap space? So, I mean, obviously, if these three are all good enough to have rookie Max extensions, you know, you drafted really well and you're going to feel pretty good about things. But just give us some perspective and in, in that big picture view of what's coming with these guys' contracts and why maybe the Pistons need to go ahead and make, if they're going to make a big move, it probably, I feel like Keith does need to happen in the next 12 months or so. Yeah. And that's a great point at the end there. So let's start with Cade. That's this summer. He's extension eligible this summer. That that conversation happens now. Now that it doesn't, won't kick in until the following season, until the 25-26 season, but we're going to know where the Pistons and Cade Cunningham stand with their relationship. And, and I, I tend to believe He's probably going to get a max or near max deal. There's potential he could get like the, what I now call the Desmond Bain max, which is it's a functional max deal, but there's some incentives and bonuses to get him up to the to, to the overall number versus just walking in and handing him here's the full five year max with you know the the designated player language and all that. Now he may say it's that or nothing, right? And then then we, we, we can make things kind of complicated and, and go forward. And that certainly has happened. That happened with DeAndre Ayton just a couple of years ago where DeAndre Ayton was, I need paid. Otherwise, like I'll go into restricted free agency. Ultimately, the Suns matched it and then traded him a year later. But that one's going to be interesting. Quentin Grimes, now you, you inherit his deal. He's extension eligible this summer. So those are going to be two things. So not only are the Pistons working with $60 million in cap space this summer and do what do we do with Fontecchio on a new deal? They're also working on the next deals for Grimes and Cunningham. Grimes could be one you may say, let's just punt it. Let's see what it looks like. Let's especially to let's let's say for whatever reason you can only play 10 games the rest of the way or whatever. You may feel a lot more comfortable saying, nah, we haven't seen enough from you with us. Like we we want to delay on that. So then you really get into a spot with with those guys, but it doesn't stop, right? That's the thing. Then it's the next year we're into Jalen Duran and Jay and Ivy, right? So now all of a sudden we're there. And then the other guys like Thompson and Sasser, those are far enough out. I don't think you're 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 worried about how you're building out your roster yet there. Obviously, with with Duran, I think we all know hopefully that's trending in the direction of, if not a max, probably a very, very expensive kind of contract in that. There'll also be a lot more clarity with the TV deal by by then. And then with a guy like Ivy, it is, let's just see, like, clearly, whatever the, I'll just call it in my, I'm editorializing here, whatever the nonsense was with him earlier this year in his whole role, it looks like we're pretty past that now. So let's see the rest of this season, next season, what does it look like? Because, Jerry, that's the benefit. You do have a little bit of time. You have to start thinking about that. The last thing I'll add in, by the time those guys are extension eligible, we'll have a lot more clarity on the TV deal. But there's one other thing that Adam Silver is not even hinting at anymore. Its expansion is coming. 
And then what you have to start thinking about, and teams are going to have to start thinking about this in about a two or three year window is, are we extending these guys? Are we open to letting a Marcus Sasser hit the market because expansion's going to come? It's not like we're going to get the TV deal a year from now, and then expansion teams will start the next year. It's going to be a couple years after that, probably, most likely. And a lot of that depends on how do they do the bidding process. But I know teams are already starting to think about that a little bit because they're, if not current contracts, it's that next round of contracts where it's starting to look like, okay, we may be in a spot where we got to plan this out a little bit differently because we've got to make sure we've got guys locked in and all those things that are coming. Because the expansion teams will also come in with, hey, we have a boatload of money to spend probably after an expansion draft. Where do we go with this? Or you can come in with a, hey, if we give you a first-round pick, will you take this terrible contract off our books in an expansion draft? There's That's a whole complicating factor. But those are definitely things you're starting to think through a little bit with your longer-term roster building. But for now, it's Cunningham and Grimes. That's I mean, you're, you're essentially on the clock with extension talks with them right now. Real, real quick, I got one quick follow-up, Amari. Those rookie extensions are tied to the cap. Am I correct in that, Keith? Like, there's no advantage. The max is. Okay. Yeah. So, like, because I was wondering, like, is there, how could you play the market with some of the, is there a way the Pistons could play the market to almost get undervalued contracts because the cap's going up? But, like, a rookie extension is going to be tied to the cap. So, when the cap goes up, that's going to go up. Anything that's not that rookie max extension isn't tied to the to the. Okay, all right. I wanted to make sure. I'm yeah, just minimum is eh, like minimum contracts yeah, yeah. are, but those are those are what they are. But yeah, so like for example, Jared Allen, he got the five year hundred million dollar deal from the Cavaliers uh-huh. a couple years ago. In that five year hundred million dollar deal, he's a flat twenty million uh, every year, which is nice because it makes it very easy, but. That twenty million only becomes more valuable as the cap goes up. Okay. Because that twenty million is flat. It's it nice. is a static number. It doesn't change. Where the dynamic number is the cap going up. Now, in the case of like Cade Cunningham or any of the other guys who signed their rookie extensions already, Anthony Edwards, Tyrese Halliburton, those guys whose deal will kick in, they're gonna get twenty-five to thirty percent of the cap, no matter where that cap number settles at, in first year salary. Now The good news for their teams is it looks like the cap's probably only going to go up somewhere in the range of three and a half to 5% from this year to next instead of the full 10 it could have. And what's nice for those teams is let's say it only goes up three and a half, which is roughly what they're projecting right now. That locks those guys in at 35 ish million in first year money. Then let's say then it goes up 10% the next year. They're already locked into the new Uh, scale. Okay. And the scale amount can only go up by a max of 8%. So now they're locked into the new contract. And as long as the cap growth outpaces their raise growth, they start to come down in percentage of cap year over year. So, so yeah, so that's, that's the, the thing. Right now, yeah, the league's being extremely conservative. And the last two estimates that have come in have come in lower than what what, it, what where their original projections were. A lot of that's tied up in the the Bally Sports stuff and all the bankruptcy there and teams having to kind of take control of their own media rights and doing over-the-air streaming and antenna streaming versus any kind of cable deals and all that stuff. So that's, that's all. It sounds cool that the Suns made all their games available to everybody in the Phoenix area if they have an antenna until it factors into the overall high for for the league then that's where it gets messy keith there's a lot the pistons are juggling no it sounds like at this stage for this offseason specifically to what extent do they need to keep in mind some of these deals that could come up for guys like ivy and Duran, or do you just kind of push that aside and you just focus on making the roster and locking up guys now and then you figure that stuff out later yeah, I think you you keep it in mind, certainly, yeah. with the length of contracts you acquire. If you go out there and get a big contract, I know Zach Levine was a whole thing for, for a little bit there. Mm-hmm. But even Zach Levine, we're now into to the point where Zach Levine's contract, because the rest of this, you can't acquire him now. So you're really only talking about a two- or three-year contract. So by the time... You're, that's running out. You're now running into the new 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 year, uh, new new money for for those guys like like Duran and Ivy. So so you're 
you aren't going to let it impact you too much if you trade for a big contract. Now, if it's a guy where he's on a big contract that he's only got one year left, that has to be factored in. Well, let's say they went out and got Brandon Ingram. If you go out and try to get a guy like Brandon Ingram, then what your challenge becomes is, all right, now we're into Brandon Ingram, and what are we going to do? Because we get him for one more year, then we have to resign him. And that becomes a whole different story because now we have to factor in Brandon Ingram on probably, if not a max, a near max deal, plus Cade Cunningham on a max or near max deal, plus then Duran on a very likely a very expensive contract moving forward than Ivy. And that's where it all starts to add up a little bit. On top of that, you're then adding probably a couple more years of top five picks, which come with not by no means bad contracts or anything, but just a little bit more money than teams that are picking in the teens and twenties. So you're talking about guys that are making 10 million a year instead of guys that are making five. So, so that those all start to add up pretty quickly. And then obviously I know I kind of threw uh, currently with any towns out there. But I think what's interesting with a guy like him is that's a long contract, right? Because that extension hasn't even started yet. So when that extension kicks in, now we're into a point where it is, all right, that's four years and that has to be a factor. Because then you have to start thinking about, all right, are we okay with this? We're, we're okay with it today. Today we're fine. We could probably even absorb it and still have 20 million in cap space to play with. It's what happens in year two, three, in year four. Of that deal, where are we going with that? So that's where the long range balance is in with the right now short term. Because and think if I told you, hey, on July first they're getting Carl Anthony Towns, most people would be like, all right, let's go. But if I told you, but in three years it's going to cost you Jalen Duran, people might be like, well, wait, no, I now now that that doesn't sound so fun. And that's the conversations the front office ownership have to be having. All right. Last one here, Keith. And it's a little bit of nuance here, but I promised we had this question asked on Twitter. So I promised I would get to it. This is from data driven Pisson fan. He asked you about the Burks TPE that was created. So was there first, was there a Burks T what was the trade exception created in that trade with the Knicks? And if there was, they ask if it had to be used before free agency or does it go away where the Pistons are an under the cap team and then would eventually become an over the cap team? Yeah, it's a really good question. I So part of what makes all of this a little tricky is chasing down all this stuff after the <laughs> fact, because the way these deals get structured, they don't always come in the way you think they're going to, if that makes sense. Like there's, there's not necessarily a, a whole thing that was, that get done. And the other important thing is, although it was Bogdanovich and Burks for, what was it, four guys or whatever yep. it was, in picks is a reporting, each team is allowed to structure a deal in the way that is most most beneficial to them. So one team may break it up into, hey, we're actually, we did two small deals here. Then another team may break it up into, we did it you know, as a much larger deal. And that's a very long way to say, I don't know for certain yet. Downside to the uh, to the trade deadline happening and then All Star break like a week later is everybody kind of shuts it down and leaves. So some of the people you need to track information now it's not always there. Now I can answer it though theoretically. They had a trade exception for anybody, and I know they still should have a little bit left on the Bagley TP that they had. That what how that works is when we go into and they also by by the way should have created one for Monte Morris. In his trade as well. So when you go into that situation there with with a TPE is he's absolutely right. You have basically through draft night to use it. Okay. Or it goes away. Because what happens is if you go under the cap by more than adding back the total value of all your exceptions, you you lose them and you just end up with cap space. So in this case, a five or ten million TPE, the Pistons would not say, "Well, we could add fifty million in cap space, but let's try to keep that." And that's not going to be a thing. That only happens if it's like, "Well, we could create like six million in cap space, or we could have this bigger exception." Then they'll go with the bigger exception, obviously. But uh, in the Pistons' case, they're they're thinking much bigger right now. I project them to be at over sixty million, which is the the most in the league for cap space right now. And it's, it's the most in the lead by a pretty good chunk. 
There's a little bit of wiggle room in there, though, because there's, I don't know how many people know with Simone Fontecchio, he's right on the borderline of meeting starter criteria. He only has to start five more games this season. And if he does that, his qualifying offer will go up. And then if his qualifying offer goes up, then his his cap hit will also go up because he's he's under what the qualifying offer will be. It's not not enough to make a massive amount. It's like two million more. So they're still going to be in the sixty million range. There's also, you know, I mean, I know you guys are aware, but there's a lot of play in the draft pick too, right? Because one, they're they're running down the Wizards. Like I said this <laughs> on front office show. Trevor was like, "Wait, what?" And he looked. He's like, "Holy cow, they are!" And I'm like, "Yeah, they're right there now." Like we still have this, you know. 27 lost pistons in our mind or whatever. And it's like, no, like they're, they're, they're pushing now up the standings a little bit. And then again, not to bring up PTSD moments, but if the lottery doesn't go your way, your pick lowers, it has a nice benefit of, you know, I said it last year at the time. I'm like, well, the silver lining was I get a little bit more cap space, which no one wanted to hear. Cause then it's like, yeah, cool. Awesome. I give us Wemby, right? Like no one cares about cap space, but it is, in this year, yeah, you, you could end up a little bit. So there's still quite a bit in flux there. But I am feel pretty good in saying they're going to be in the 60 million range. They're going to you know, move forward that way um, and have a whole bunch to, to, to play with and do stuff. So that's a very long answer to, yeah, TPA could be used if they've still got one. And we'll, I'll know one that hopefully early next week and we'll have it all updated on spot track. So you could have that in play by the time we get to the draft. But otherwise... Shortly after the draft, that that will go away when they go the cap space route. And it's important to note if they use it at the draft, let's say you had a ten million and they brought in a ten million player, they will. Um, that's ten million. That's going to come off the books for next year if that guy's got a got a contract that carries into next season. So, so that's the 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 challenge with that part of it too. Keith, thank you so much. Always have a blast. These ones are super easy for Amari and I because all we know we just ask the questions and we let you cook and do you and <laughs> you're the best. And that's why we have you as often as we do. So you came on right before the deadline, came on right after the deadline. I'm sure we'll have you as we approach off season as well. And so thank you so much. Real quick, just let everybody know where they can find. I know, you know, I hope people know the podcast if they're not, but you know, you write as well and, and the website and all that. So let people know where they can find all of that, your work, you know, the website, what it offers and the pod. Yeah. So for my, if you like all this stuff, cap and roster and all this stuff, you can find all that kind of written work over at spottrack.com. I, I did a thing. If people hadn't seen it, I, I wrote a reaction piece to every single trade that was done. So even the Corey Joseph salary dump. Like I, I wrote a wrote a reaction piece to that. I I really got into you know every every one of the deals that was done. The the Ishmael Kamagate draft rights trade. Like why why and with that. So that's all up on Spot Track, and there'll be a lot more stuff coming. Big picture off season stuff. There's a lot of stuff coming down the line. That is how do I put this? Like stuff that is just it's it's the stuff. We're we're focused on off season preview stuff, next contract series, next stuff for teams. I'm gonna write a piece about the Timberwolves and everything they're facing. So that'll be all over at Spot Trek. Then you can find the podcast I do with Trevor Lane, NBA front office show. We do that Monday through Friday, talk about all the latest news and notes. We have a lot of fun. Every Friday is front office Fridays, which is a live show where we take questions. I know uh, Doug McMenamin is in here. We On our show, we call him Doug Not. He's always in there asking good questions and having a lot of fun with us. And We have a great time with, with the front office show and have a blast with that. And then Trevor and I started a oh, yeah. uh, sub stack called the Basketball Bulletin, which is where it's a chance for both of us to get some written thoughts out there that don't necessarily fit somewhere else. So for Trevor, it's a chance for him to do some non-Laker stuff and get that out there. And then there's a chance for me to put some non-cap and roster stuff. So I'm going to have a lot of stuff. I, Bryce, I know I talked with you about this off air. I spend a lot of time and just spent more time this year watching Bon Verde Academy and spending a lot of time with, with them, which is the premier basketball, high school basketball factory in the world. And I've got a whole piece that I'm working on putting together that's it's not guys for this year, but it's all the guys you're going to be hearing about nice. in the 2025 draft. And it's, yeah, it's Cooper Flag. We all know him. Liam McNilly. But there's a lot more guys beyond him. And they've even got some younger kids, too, that are like sophomores and juniors. 
that can really play that are going to be, you're going to see them on the recruit list and you're going to see all that stuff. So I've got a lot of thoughts about a lot of their players coming up uh, with that some scouting stuff for this year's draft class. So just different things for, for, for me. And that's what we're going to use the basketball bulletin for. Plus my game notes, when I, whatever games I watch, if I made notes on them, I put those up the next morning. So we'll, we'll get back into that when uh, NBA games get into full swing. Awesome. Thank you so much, Keith. Amari, take it away. Absolutely, Keith. Always a pleasure to have you on. Uh, no one does a better job of breaking down the NBA cap situation and every and everything else besides Keith. So always great to have you on. And we're looking forward to having you on again, hopefully pretty soon here as the Pistons enter the offseason as one of the main players to make some moves happen. And hopefully they'll have some stuff that we can break down then as well. Uh, so again, Keith, again, always a pleasure. Big thanks to our audio producer, Robin Chan, our editor-in-chief, Nicole Avery Nichols, our executive producer, Anjanette Delgado, and our sports editor, Kirkland Crawford. And as always, big shout out to Wes. And we will talk to you all next week. <laughs>